Worthy is the name of Jesus, huh? Amen. Thank you, Kalani, for that song. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to the book of Acts, chapter number 7. We are going to pick up where we left off, it seems like, eons ago. Um, Larry and I had the privilege of spending some time in a very beautiful state in our union, known as the state of Ohio. Any Ohioans in the house? I know of a couple for sure. Um, had the privilege of spending some time in Kenny Dettelback's hometown of Cleveland, Ohio, of all places. Uh, but uh, what, a, what a beautiful time of year to be back in that part of the country because uh, those of you that are familiar with the Midwest or even the Northeast, the, tr- the trees start to turn this time of year. It gets really, really pretty. And uh, um, what, a, what a blessed country we live in. And uh, oh, Ohio holds a very special place in my heart because I'm connected with some guys there that are, um, that are very dear to us, very dear to me. And I'm hoping you can meet some of them, hopefully sooner than later as we connect with some of these churches. We were at a conference um, last week uh, in a church in New Philadelphia, Ohio, which, is, which happens to be an old Moravian colony. I don't know what you know about the Moravians, but a very unique group of Bible believers from back in the day. So Ohio is a very unique and special place. We visited in Akron, Ohio, uh, the, grave, uh, the grave site of, uh, of, a very, of a hero of the faith of mine by the name of A.W. Tozier. Uh, it's interesting as you drive into Akron, there are signs all over place, all over the town about be, it being the home of LeBron James, but there's absolutely no mention of a man like A.W. Tozier, who wrote a huge number of books that speak dearly and deeply to the heart. Uh, in fact, it was a book that he wrote several years ago titled um, "The Pursuit of God" that helped, that was key in changing my life in terms of of. Um, how we are to view God in this journey, in this life. And we found his gravesite in this obscure little Presbyterian church cemetery. I mean, out in the boonies, out in the middle of nowhere. And no big mausoleum, nothing. Just a little gravestone with his date of birth, his name, his date of birth, his date of death, and the phrase, man of God. And that's it. That's the only place, the only way you'll find this guy's gravesite. So it was... For me, it was an honor to be there, to be able to see where they laid this man's humanly body to rest. And these are the heroes of the faith, guys that I really look up to and embrace in terms of how they teach and how they reveal this heart of God that is so incredible and so deep. This God who loves you more than you will ever know. So that said, this morning, we're going to pick up where we left off a couple of weeks ago. Oh, by the way, Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but I was able to spend time, precious quiet time with my wife in Cleveland. So for three days, we hung out. Our anniversary was last Saturday, 39 years. Listen, wait, 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 don't clap yet. Here's why. Almost as long as the children of Israel were in the wilderness, right? So one year short, but we had a great time just hanging out. We just kind of visited different sites, jumped on a ferry to... Uh, I forget the name of the island, but Put-in Bay is where there was a huge battle during the War of 1812 where the U.S. was able to take uh, Lake Erie from the British. So we got some to, to experience and see some really neat stuff like that. What a special place. We live in an incredible country, man. And uh, having said that, we're going to focus on Stephen's country this morning and his view and his struggle and his love for his people who had, for whatever reasons, as we know from the Gospels, had strayed from this loving God who came down to this planet to establish a kingdom and to be the Savior and the Deliverer and the Messiah of the Jewish faith, of the Jewish people. And that's where we find ourselves. We find ourselves in an, in an interesting book in the New Testament known as the book of Acts, a book that is laying out for you and for me <clears throat> this very unique time period in the history of the church. The church being this unique entity that God established or God preordained, also referred to in the scriptures as the bride of Christ. You hold in God's plan and in his purpose a very unique place. 
The church, it has a very incredible place that it holds with God and with Jesus Christ. You are his bride. And there's no other people group that have been blessed than have been given what we have, which is that relationship, number one. And then number two, the fact that the Spirit of God indwells you. He lives inside of you. And you have the power to overcome in this life because of that gift. We saw that in the book of Acts chapter 2, if you remember that, where the Holy Spirit came down and he, he empowered his disciples to be used for his glory. Because what we're finding in this book, and this is why it's titled the book of Acts, we're seeing this, this journey, this birth of the church, this journey of a lifetime when God goes from a very Jewish-centric kingdom physical on this earth to a spiritual kingdom which is going to include and involve you and I. And here we are 2,000 years later and we find ourselves still a part of this great journey, this, this mission that he has for you and for me. And what we're finding in these chapters that we're in right now is a transition that is taking place in order for this thing called the church to be birthed. It was really birthed or born in Acts chapter number 2, but now you're seeing God through this transition moving from a very Jewish-centric culture, if you will, to a more Gentile, opening the gospel to the entire world. And that's where we find ourselves this morning. So if you've got, got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Acts chapter number seven. If you remember from our, from our previous studies in chapter six, I began to share with you or reveal to you some thoughts about how God began calling out certain individuals because this thing called the church began to explode and you need to be mindful and you need to be aware of the fact that the early church was made up of all Jewish people. They were all Jews. And the reason why was because God was still providing them an opportunity to establish his kingdom on this planet. What makes chapter 7 so unique is this is where there's a huge change in the transition. This is a, this is a fork in the road, if you will. And there's some 62 verses in the chapter. 52 of these verses are dedicated to a sermon that this guy named Stephen that we introduced you to you a couple weeks ago, a sermon that he preaches to the Jewish race, if you will, to the leaders of the Jewish faith. We're going to see in our text this morning, Caiaphas, the high priest, shows up questioning what God's men were doing in terms of reaching the Jews of Jerusalem with the gospel. They were beginning to be threatened by this message of Jesus Christ and They began to question and doubt and confront and to push back on everything that God was doing with these early believers. And this is where we find ourselves this morning is in this incredible chapter that God ultimately, because of what we are going to see here in the next several weeks, we're going to see in our text this morning that there's actually in this chapter, there's 52 verses that are dedicated to Stephen's sermon, but I'm going to take four weeks to cover each one of these little sections of the sermon because there's so much depth. What you find in this chapter is the history of Israel and God using Stephen's sermon to really drive home the light and the truth of who Jesus is and who it was that they crucified on the cross And reminding these religious folks that it wasn't about religion that was going to get them to God, but to have a relationship with the Redeemer, with the Savior. And this is what chapter 7 is about. Isn't it interesting? Those of you that have been involved with Bible study, that you find this transition in chapter 7. 7 being the number of completeness, where God is completing something and All right, you Bible students, chapter number eight or the number eight is the number of what? New beginnings. You know what you're going to see in chapter number eight? A whole new beginning. You're going to see for the first time a non-Jewish person come to Christ just like you and I did. An individual who is not mentioned by name, but we know him as the what? 
the Ethiopian eunuch. And in chapter 9, an interesting individual, a key individual in the Bible, comes to Christ. And in chapter 10, the number 10 is the number of the what? The Gentiles, a full-blown Gentile, Cornelius, an Italian guy with a pizza parlor in Rome, comes to Christ just like you and I did. No, just kidding about the pizza parlor. He was a warrior. He was a captain. So you see God doing some incredible things in these chapters that we're going to be focusing on in these, in these coming weeks. It's the turning point chapter. And in these 52 verses, you're going to find these profound truths about how, how, how Stephen uses the history of the Old Testament to really retell their, their own history a history that they, the, Jew, the Jews of Stephen's day, failed to understand. Isn't that the case in our country right now with all these monuments? As a matter of fact, tomorrow on Columbus Day, tomorrow is Columbus Day, there's a group out of Brooklyn, New York, an anarchist group known as RAM, which stands for Resistance Abolitionist Movement. Their, jo- their goal is to take the five statues of Columbus that are scattered throughout Manhattan and Brooklyn and deface them and bring them down as best they could. You know what people are trying to do? They're trying to erase history. You're trying to eliminate anything about who you are and what you're about. about. What makes this country so unique and so special is God set it aside providentially for a unique purpose and a unique plan. And isn't it interesting that our adversary is using, is using race. And I, I, I've heard, I've mentioned a couple times how there's two things that are sacred to God, marriage and race. And those are the two things that the adversary is attacking like nothing else in the day and age in which we live. And because of this whole racial confrontation that we're seeing and we're realizing, we're trying to erase and deface the very history that at one point really made this country what it is and what it stood for and its foundings. Let me share with you just a couple quotes about history and those of you that have been around here for a while, you know that when we study the Bible in this church, we apply it or we study it from three different perspectives, right? A historical perspective, you hold in your hands a history book History, take, take that word history for a second. It's two syllables. It's his story. It's the story of God implementing his kingdom on planet earth someday. That's been his intent from the very, very beginning. The theme of the Bible is a coming kingdom. It's a battle for a kingdom and a throne. If you could just understand that one basic truth, that one basic premise... The Bible will bring a whole different light to how you approach it and how you study it. Because what you have is an adversary. There are evil forces out there that will do anything and everything to hinder that kingdom from being established literally on planet Earth and spiritually in your and my life. I don't know if you realize this about who you are. Your body, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19, is the temple of the Holy Ghost. Now, there was, a, uh, there was a part of the temple in the New Testament as well as the Old Testament where, 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 God, met, where God met with his people. That is known as the, ho- the most holy place or the holy of holies. It's also referred to as the throne room. Did you know that there's a throne room inside of you? It's that inner sanctum where God dwells where the I am dwells, where he reaches out to you and to me every single day to have fellowship with you, to have intimacy, intimacy with you. That's God's plan. That's, his been, that's been his desire from the very, very beginning is to establish his kingdom and spiritually that kingdom or that throne is in you. Remember in Hebrews chapter 4, verses 15 and 16, when Paul wrote these words, he says, come therefore boldly unto the throne of grace. Where is that throne today? It's in you. And it's in those times where you can, your prayer life, where you come boldly and he promises this to you and to me, where you you can obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Mercy and grace. 
What a God we serve. What a God that we have in our Bible that is there availing himself to us to meet our very every need in our lives. History, it's a history book. It's also a book of doctrine. It's filled with truths and with prophecy and with light. This book reveals to us not only about what God has done historically, but what also what he's going to do in the future. And then it's also a book of principles, principles that we could apply in our everyday lives so that we could be and so that we could accomplish what God has, has desired for us to accomplish. To embrace the mission. So it's a book of history, the historical application, the doctrinal application, and what we refer to as the devotional or the inspirational application where the Bible becomes real to your life so that you can walk out these doors and live out a life that is glorifying Jesus Christ. But it's in history where men tend to go astray. Listen to the words of Edmund Burke, an old American philosopher. Those who don't know history are destined to repeat it. Theodore Roosevelt once said, the more you know about the past, the better prepared you are, you are for the future. And good old Winston Churchill, just before World War II, said these words, that the only thing that man learns from history is that man doesn't learn anything from history. <laughs> and this is why we continue to repeat the same issues and the same problems and the same challenges and dilemmas. You know what I see happening in this country? Exactly what was going on historically with the nation of Israel during the days of Isaiah and Jeremiah and Hosea and all these prophets that God called up and called out to preach against the sin and the depravity of what was going on amongst his people. Listen, church, we have got to wake up. Man, his kingdom could come tomorrow. His, the rapture is the next event on his calendar. It could happen today. I have a question for you. What will you be found? Where will you be found when that time comes, when that call, when that trumpet sound happens? He's going to set up his kingdom. And we're going to see some of that this morning as we consider our text. Look briefly with me real quick in Acts chapter number 6, just to kind of give you a little bit of context, just to remind you of, of what was going on in these guys' lives as we start to delve into this very significant chapter, chapter 7. If you remember, <clears throat> this group of, of Jewish, Greek-speaking believers showed up in Jerusalem and had come to accept what the disciples were preaching, but they began to question and to doubt some of their methods and it's in chapter number 6, verse uh, number 1 and 2, where you find uh, this, this charge, this challenge by these Grecian believers, these Jewish, Greek-speaking believers. And as a result, God said, and the disciples stepped up and said, all right, we're going to call out seven guys, and two guys in particular show up on the list here in verse number 5. And they saying, pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip. And he mentions five other guys, which we're not going to get into, because Philip, I'm sorry, Stephen and Philip play key roles in the next two chapters that we're going to be looking at. Stephen in all of chapter number seven, and in chapter eight, this guy named Philip. Huge roles. Roles are starting to change now. No longer are we going to hear from Peter and John so much. There's a transition playing out. There's a transition happening right before our eyes. And if you rem rem remember this from a couple weeks ago in verse 9, another group of people show up to confront them, these free-thinking libertines. Verse 9, then, came, then there arose certain of the synagogue, again, Jews that were questioning and doubting and denying the message of the apostles, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and the Cyrenians, and here's an interesting group, and the Alexandrians, and of them Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. 
Then they suborned men which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. They were saying, Look, man, this guy Stephen, he ain't preaching this religion message that we grew up knowing. Anybody been there? And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes. And they came upon him and they caught him up and brought him to the council. This council is known as the Sanhedrin. This is a group of very significant and profound religious leaders. As a matter of fact, in chapter 7, verse 1, we're going to introduce you of, to the head of the Sanhedrin, a guy by the name of Caiaphas, the same guy that was present when Jesus was led to Pilate, who sanctioned the crucifixion of Jesus Christ from a Jewish role and responsibility. It says in verse 13, And he set up false witnesses which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous which are against this, this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And is it interesting that a mere four year, 40 years later that's exactly what happened? In 70 AD, the Roman Emperor Titus came and destroyed the temple and scattered the Jews to the four winds. And they ceased to exist as a group, as a people, as a nation. Listen to this. Until 1948, a mere 70 years ago. Why is that? We're going to see that here this morning. Look at verse 15. And all that that sat in the council looking steadfastly on him, they saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. We talked about Stephen's countenance and this, the profoundness of his heart and his attitude as he stayed true to the message of Jesus Christ. Now look with me now in verse number one of chapter seven as we start to delve into this very fascinating chapter as God uses Stephen to preach a message that is a profound outline, a significant outline of the, old, of the entire Old Testament, retelling their own history and how they, ra- how they failed to connect who Jesus was as it related to their history. Chapter 7 and verse 1. Then said the high priest, are these things so? Comes up, confronts Stephen. All these accusations, Stephen, are these things so? And listen to Stephen's response. And he said, men and brethren and fathers, hearken. For the God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Sharan and said unto him, get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and, from, and, and come into the land which I sh- will show thee. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans, and he dwelt in Sharan. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into his land wherein ye now dwell. And he gave him none, and he gave him none inheritance in it, no, not so much as to set his foot on Yet he promised that he would give it to him for a possession and to his seed after him when as yet as he had no child. Hang on to that thought. We're going to break these verses down in a second. Look at verse 6. And God spake on this wise that his seed should sojourn in a strange land and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil 400 years. And the nation to me shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that shall they come forth and serve me in this place. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begat Jacob. And Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. Well, aren't those some cool verses? Now, what does all this mean? You know what he's doing in this sermon? He's reminding them of their history. These are guys, the Sanhedrin, this council, that knew the Bible. They had an Old Testament. 
they could rip it, tear it apart, and put it back together. And the first place that he takes them to as he kicks off this incredible sermon that we're going to break down in all of chapter number seven is this reminder of God's promise to them. So how easy we forget, huh? It's like Churchill said that the only thing that man learns from history is that man doesn't learn anything from history. And you know what they forgot? They forgot and they were forgetting about this promise that God had made to them historically about the land. Let me show you where that happens in the Bible. Everybody turn with me now to the book of Genesis, chapter number 15. You know, it wasn't that long ago, one administration ago, whether it be the State Department or the Department of Defense, or even the White House, every time they made reference to those crazy Islamists that were taking over most of what is Iraq and Syria, our country, our administration, chose to refer to that part of the land or that group, not as ISIS, like you're hearing them refer to today, but as ISIL. The Islamic State of Iraq... Listen to this, in the Levant. The press was referring, it to, referring to it as the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. What is modern day Iraq and what is modern day Syria. That was the focus or the primary intent of these people is take, to take over what is known today as the Fertile Crescent. And sure enough, man, they were coming through and it was happening. Some of you remember we were holding a Bible study back on St. Francis Drive when we were still in that office. We did a little series referred to as Unlocking the End Times. And we went back to Genesis chapter 15 in that study to show you how the land that was promised to Abraham was all of what we see today that is being battled with the Islamic State. And you know what's really crazy? Guess who else has shown up? Guess who else is a key and a key player and an actor in that realm right now? The Russians. Ezekiel 38 coming to fruition. The Persians, also known as Iraq and Iran, having an influence in that part of the world. Saudi Arabia just this week made an agreement with the Russians. What is happening here? What is playing out? This stage, folks, is being set all for one reason to take the land of promise that God, the promise that God made to the Jewish people in Genesis chapter 15. Look with me here in first, verse number 15. Verse number, uh, let's start in verse number 14. I think it is. I believe it is. Verse 18. In the same day, this is after a lot of the uh, other things that were being promised to Israel or to the Jewish people were made to, 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 in Genesis to Abraham. Again, keep in mind that Abraham is the key player at this stage of God's purpose and God's plan. In Genesis chapter 12, as God calls him out, he says, all right, Abraham, I want you to know this. I'm going to make you a great nation. And from your seed are all the nations of the world are going to be blessed. And we saw in our text this morning in, in uh in Acts chapter 7 and verse 1 or verse number 8, that it was going to be through this, this seed, through that circumcision experience that they were going to give birth to Isaac and to Jacob and then ultimately the 12 tribes. That's the seed that God is referring to. These people groups that I've determined, that I've established, they're going to come through your loins, Abraham. And these people that have come to be known as the Jewish people now needed a place to live. And he determines that location here in verse number 18. And in the same day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. Are you with me? A covenant, a promise. A covenant with Abraham saying, unto thy seed, his seed being his descendants, Isaac, Jacob, and the 12 sons, Unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt. Anybody think of the key river in Egypt? 
the Nile. That's where the boundary begins. Not this little sliver of land that you see as modern day Israel today. You know where it begins? In Egypt. Look at this. This is, this is a crazy promise. I have given it to the land of the, of, of the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. Go back in your, back of your Bible and look at some of your maps. Guess where the Euphrates River is? right down the middle of modern-day Iraq. Now catch this. The Kenites and the Kenzites and the Kadmonites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Rephraims and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Girgashites and the Jezubites. These are all the people that were living in historical Canaan land, but there's a group here that shows up. They're known as the Hittites. yes the people group that Uriah was from. You know who the modern day Hittites are? This is fascinating. The Turks. Turkey. Here's what's crazy. Imagine a map, and I should have put the map up, but all the way to Turkey, you have this left line, this triangle that goes to the river Jordan, I'm sorry, to the river Nile, and all the way to the right, you have the river Euphrates. That is the land of promise. It's the same land that the previous administration had in mind when they were referring to it as ISIL, the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, which includes Israel and Egypt. Tell me there weren't some people back in Washington that were trying to figure some things out. Here's the point. Here's what I'm driving at. You better know, and you better realize, and I'd better come to this conclusion, hopefully sooner than later, that God's plan is coming to fruition right before our eyes. Listen, folks, it's happening. It's coming. One of these days, one of these evenings on Wednesday nights, we'll lay out these, these prophetic events that are happening, that are playing out right before our eyes, and yet the church is asleep. We're more concerned about what all these knuckleheads are doing on Sunday mornings, whether they're, they're, they're standing up for the flag. No, you know what matters more than anything for you and for me? We need to see souls saved and people discipled. Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, don't get caught up with the affairs of this life. Focus on your mission. Focus on your purpose. And that is spiritual seed. So he makes this promise to Abraham in this amazing place and he landmarks he landmarks the boundaries of the levant of the promise it says in proverbs 22 and verse 28 remove not the ancient landmarks which thy fathers have set are the words of solomon in proverbs 22 in verse number 28 he says, don't remove those. Don't remove those boundaries. Anybody have any clue, any idea what our or what the significant landmark is in our lives? As believers, not as Jews, we know about the promised land for them, right? What is our, what is our landmark? It's the cross. That's your landmark this is the key milestone in our lives that transformed, that transitioned this great plan of God to reach the entire world, to involve you, to include me in this journey. That is our promise. Look with me in Romans chapter 8, verses 14 and 18. And just like God promised the nation of Israel this piece of land in what is right smack in the heart of the Middle East where all the chaos and wars and battles are playing out right there. Iraq, Syria, Israel, all the way down in Egypt. All that is happening right before our eyes, right as we speak. God has made a promise to you and to me. And it's found in Romans chapter 8. And in Revelation chapter 20, look with me real quick in, Rev in Romans chapter number 8. It says this in verse number 14. Everybody there, Romans 8? Verse number 14. 
For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, remember that truth? When did the Spirit of God enter you or enter the church, the body of Christ? Acts chapter 2, he indwells. So anybody who is part of this thing called the church, not Israel, Israel is not the church and the church is not Israel, but anybody who is led by the Spirit of God because of what we accepted at the cross, look at this. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the what? The sons of God. Isn't that what we sang this morning? Look at verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but we have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, listen to this, folks, Abba, Father. You have the privilege of sitting on his lap and just calling him Daddy. That's what the word Abba means. This is our God. This is the God of the New Testament. This is our Jesus. Look with me now in verse number 16. For the Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, listen to this, folks, then heirs, heirs of God, and this is mind-blowing to me, and join heirs with Christ. Wow. You know what this reminds me of? That verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, where Paul wrote... Eyes have not seen or ears heard what God has in store for those that love him. You know what he just said to you and to me? That you are going to, you're going to be a joint heir with Christ in his millennial kingdom. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that nuts? How many of us really deserve that? Seriously, think about and ponder the depth of that truth. Look at this. And if children and heirs and joint heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that ye may be also glorified together. You will sit in glory with the very God that died for you someday. And we don't have the time this morning to cover all these events that are going to play out between now and this coming kingdom Remember the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come in earth as it is in heaven. It's coming, man. That kingdom is coming. You'd better be ready. Are you? Will we be found ready? Revelation chapter 20, verse 6 says this. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Guess who he's talking about? You. There's the promise. God's involving us. He's including us in joining and reigning with him in his coming kingdom. Man, what a promise that is. And you know where that kingdom's going to play out? You don't want to know the ground zero of that kingdom? It's going to be Jerusalem. And we don't have time this morning. I wish I could reveal to you, man, all that's going to play out in Revelation chapters 19, 20, and 21 as God begins to restructure and redeem his creation to bring forth this new purpose, this new plan that we get to be a part of. Wow, what a God we serve Another thought to consider this morning is we need to be reminded of the prison that we all came from. And the Bible does that here for us in verses number six and seven. Look with me in verse six. And God spake on the wise that this seed should sojourn in a strange land and that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil for a hundred years. I think you're familiar with this part of the story. As you get back to the end of Genesis and in the early part of the book of Exodus, you find this new Pharaoh showing up who the Bible says he knew not Joseph. He didn't know what God was doing with the children of Israel, even when they were found in Egypt. And you know what he did? You know what Pharaoh did? He put them in bondage. Listen to Exodus chapter 1, verses 13 and 14. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, and they made their lives bitter with hard, with hard bondage. Did you catch that, folks? With hard bondage. In mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field, all their service wherein they made them serve 
was with rigor. That word rigor means severe hardness. You know what they were? They were slaves. They were slaves to this Egyptian Pharaoh. You know what Pharaoh is a type of in the Bible? He's a type of the adversary. The word Satan simply means adversary. You know what Egypt's a picture of? The world. Always has been. Do you remember? You remember? Remember? (laughs) Remember when you were caught up in that bondage? The bondage of your sin? Your depravity, that thing that hindered you, that blinded you, that kept you from becoming and realizing all that God has for you. You get to dwell with Him, for God's sakes. Man, don't take that for granted. Don't poo-poo that. You are a joint heir with Jesus Christ. You are a child of the King. You sit in a heavenly place. Act like it, for God's sakes. Know it and embrace it. You know what Jesus did on the cross? He liberated us. He liberated us from the penalty of sin. And the day that you accepted him as your savior, he indwelled you with his spirit. Now he liberates you from the power of sin in your life. You have the power to overcome. You choose whether or not you're going to do that. Now in the future, prophetically, when you get that glorified body, right? When you come back with him at the inheritance phase, now you're separated not from the penalty and the power, but from the presence of sin in your life. He's liberated you past, present, future. Look with me now in, um, in a verse somewhere. <laughs> Look with me. Uh, yeah, Jesus' first sermon. Look at Luke chapter 4. The gospel of Luke. I want you to listen to Jesus' the very first sermon that Jesus, is pre- that Jesus preached is found in the gospel of Luke Chapter number four, immediately after his baptism and prior to his baptism or immediately following his baptism, he gets tempted by the devil. Isn't it interesting that he goes being referred to as Satan, your adversary in the Old Testament. Now he's referred to as the devil in the New Testament. Now, why is that? Remember those of you Bible study students, the words of the Bible matter. Satan, your adversary now has become the devil in your life. You know what the word devil means? accuser you know how he brings you down in this life by accusing by bringing about accusations in your life and listen to how jesus dealt with him after immediately after his his um, baptism and also the temptation of christ it says this in verse number 12 and jesus Answered him, said, it is, thou not shall not tempt the Lord thy God. And when the devil had ended, everybody with me? Verse 13, and when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a what? For a season. You better mark that, right? We just changed seasons here a month or so ago, about three weeks ago. And just as sure as winter's coming, he'll come back into your life to tempt you again, to accuse you again. Look at verse 14, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. Did you catch that? The power of the Spirit into Galilee. And there went a fame of him throughout all the region round about, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. Now his ministry is kicking into high gear. And he came to Nazareth. Nazareth was his hometown. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up, And as custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he stood up for to read. And there he delivered, was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah, the book of Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. And he's actually reading, if you want to look at the text in time, Isaiah chapter number 61. And listen to what he read. Look into what he quoted. Jesus' first sermon. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Isn't that what our theme is? Taking the gospel to the world. The gospel to the poor, he has sent me, listen to this folks, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, 
and recovering the sight of the blind and to set at liberty them that are bruised. Man, he came to liberate you, to free you from the world, from your adversary. It says in verse number 19, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord and he closed the book and he gave it again to the minister and he sat down in all the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened on him and he began to say unto them, this day, this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. Did you catch that, folks? He wants to liberate you. He wants to free you from whatever is binding you, from hindering, from becoming all that he's called you to be, all that he desires for you to accomplish in this incredible journey, this life, this inheritance that he offers you. Join him, man. Join him. And the last principle and the last thought is God reminding us of his purpose in our lives. It says in verse 8, and he gave him the covenant of circumcision. Right behind that word circumcision, there's a little punctuation mark. You know what that is? And it's not a body part. It's called a colon. (laughs) What is the depth or what is the significance of circumcision? If you want to take the time sometime, go back to Genesis chapter 10 where God took his covenant with Abraham to a whole other level as it relates to his seed. You know what he told them to do? All the Jewish males that come into the camp, and not just the Jewish males, but strangers that be, become part of, our, part of our, uh, our assembly, he says, is immediately after they're born, on the eighth day. What's the number eight represent? New beginnings. On that eighth day, you're going to take that part of the male anatomy, and you're going to cut the foreskin. You know what that part of the anatomy, and I'm not going to get crazy or nutty here or rated X with you. You know what it represents? That part of the male anatomy where the seed exists, where the seed is used to accomplish with Abraham what he desires him to accomplish. Man, we don't even have time to get into what he's going to do in the millennial reign and in eternity as it relates to seed. But that's what he's driving home for you and for me. Because Jesus took this same truth and applied it to the disciples in a very profound and spiritual way in the Gospel of John, chapter number 15. Everybody turn there because I want you to see this. So he took what was literal and physical with the nation of Israel, and now he's going to provide this whole other level of revelation as it relates to God's expectation of his disciples, his followers in this thing called the church. Look with me here in the Gospel of John chapter 15. I'm going to read the first eight verses. Jesus says, I am the true vine, And my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Are you getting the jest here? Where does fruit come from? A tree. What gave birth to the tree? A seed. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. So some of that suffering and some of those challenges and those difficulties in your lives, don't get mad at God. Don't get frustrated. Don't give up. Don't quit. You know what he's doing? He's purging it. I have these apricot trees, and my wife will tell you, man, I baby those things This is all that is left of my grandfather's orchard, which was huge at one time. There's four of them. 
And those are my babies, <laughs> those four trees. They provide me shade, and if the fruit doesn't freeze, some fruit every once in a while, and some incredible fruit. But I take care of those trees, and one of the, one of the main things that I have to do every fall, and it'll happen when the leaves come down, I'll purge them. We use the term what? Pruning. Why? Because some of those branches, I've already identified them, spray paint, they're dead. You know what happens with that dead branch? It's not sucking energy or life that the other healthy branches need. And God says, you know what? There's some dead things in your life that I'm going to remove so that I could bring forth more fruit in your life. And he says for this in verse 3, Now he, ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide, listen to me, folks. This is the key. Abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine and no more can ye accept that ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches and he that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit for without me ye can do nothing. Did you catch that church? For without him ye can do whatever you want. That's kind of us though, huh? We do whatever we want. No, you won't ever realize all that he has for you in this life unless you abide with him. That's the intimacy. I was talking about A.W. Tozier. You know what? how God used that dude in my life to reveal to me what it means to abide, what it means to embrace as the deer panteth for the water brooks, so my heart panteth after thee, Tozier wrote. The pursuit of God. This God that lives inside of you that wants nothing more from you than you. And that comes through abiding. And he says this next. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered and men gather them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. How many people just take the last part of that verse, huh? And say, hey, if I just ask God whatever I want, he'll give it to me. It says right here, no, it's based on a condition. Look at verse number seven. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, that's conditional. And look at verse eight. This is where I'm going to end this passage. Herein is my Father glorified. This is why you exist. This is why God gave me another breath, another heartbeat right now. It's for his glory. Herein is my father glorified that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be, listen to this, my disciples. Isn't that awesome? Nine times the word abide shows up in the text. Nine, all right, Bible students, the number of what? Number of fruit. Abide. 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 He's not telling you go to church. He didn't say go to church and you're going to glorify me. He didn't say get baptized. No, he said abide. Abide in me. And let my abide in you. And herein is my father glorified. In a, in a couple days, we have a team coming down from Kansas City, Santa Fe Impact. That is an opportunity for us as a church like never before to live these truths out so that we can see some fruit from that experience, from that time together with these people. Imagine the hearts that God is preparing of some of the folks, some of our community right now so that they could receive his word, so that he can use you in their lives Pray this up. Pray it up to him. Abide in him. Let that be our prayer over the next couple of weeks, that God be glorified. That our only prayer should be to see these souls saved, these souls come to Jesus Christ. And then the last thing I want to leave you with, that's an outward fruit bearing. There's an inward fruit bearing again. Right? We know that in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, when he talked about the fruit of the Spirit. He says, the fruit of the Spirit are these, and there's nine of them. Isn't that interesting? Nine, right? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, 
gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, humbleness, and temperance. Of such is there is no law. You can't put laws or you can't put rules on people that are being lived and are being governed by the fruit of the Spirit. Know what it means to experience His love, His joy, and His peace in your life. He offers that to us. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for our time together this morning. Lord, we give you glory. And I pray, Lord, that as we consider this great message, this sermon in Acts chapter 7, this transitional time as you bring this whole literal Jewish kingdom in the first century to a close, I pray, Lord God, that you would open up this book and reveal to us, Lord, the power of your spirit and how you're going to work and you're going to use this thing called the church to bring forth your gospel to a lost, hopeless, and dying world. And Lord, here we find ourselves 2,000 years later in Santa Fe, New Mexico, the uttermost. Lord, still with the privilege and the honor of realizing and accomplishing the gospel and the message that you've blessed us with. We know from the book of 1 Peter that your word, Lord, is that seed. That, Lord, all we need to do is be the Johnny Appleseed, Lord, and plant them and plant it in the hearts and in the minds of the precious souls in our community. Use us, Lord God. Use this body for your glory. Lord, and we'll thank you and we'll praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow. (laughs) That was awesome. Thank you, Pastor. With what we've heard today, there is no fear. Let's stand and let's recognize who we are today, that we are no longer slaves to fear. You